Right. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for, for coming. Um, uh, we have uh, a very interesting discussion, very interesting issue to discuss. Um, how do we boost the domestic investment landscape? And I think that is accepted to be one of the major problems that the British economy faces, persistently low levels of investment underlying weak productivity and weak growth. So could hardly be a more important and relevant issue to discuss. And we're delighted to have uh, three people who uh, are uh, very wise on the subject and uh, looking forward to hearing what they all have to say. We have, first of all, Andrew Griffith, uh, who known to everybody, I think, uh, uh, Financial Secretary to the Treasury, now City Minister, uh, former head of the, the, the policy unit, and before going to politics, um, uh, Chief Financial Officer at uh, Sky. Um, we have uh, Mike Eakins, who's Chief Investment Officer of the Phoenix Group and with a long and distinguished career in the city. And we have Ray Newton-Smith, Chief Economist of the, the CBI, um, and again with a long career in economic uh, analysis uh, in various places uh, over the years. So delighted to, to have all three of you here with us. I'm going to ask you to speak, if you, if you can, for just sort of three or four minutes to set the scenes. Um, and then um, I may have a couple of questions, and then we will open the floor. So I think we begin with, with Andrew, if that's OK. Right. David, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Policy Exchange, for bringing this uh, present company accepted, this excellent group. Uh, together to talk about one of the biggest opportunities for us as we seek to uh, recast the government's objectives in terms of growth. Uh, so the objective that the Chancellor and the Prime Minister have set me is to make the UK one of the world's most competitive locations for financial services and unleash investment. Uh, doing both of those things is incredibly important. The acid test, uh, I think, of my role is that we can deliver benefits to not just the City of London, but to a mid-terrace in Middlesbrough. That's, that's where we've got to create uh, that linkage. Uh, and we do that by unlocking investment in infrastructure, exactly the sort of long-term uh, productive investment that the UK is crying out for, uh, and which is holding back uh, the supply side, those bypasses not built, uh, the affordable housing, the regeneration of our town centres, and the transition to a green, uh, low, low carbon economy. Uh, great investment opportunities of our time, uh, but which have gone underexploited. So the metaphor the Chancellor uses is Big Bang 2, um, a radical uh, reinvention of the financial sector. It's, it's the largest single sector of our economy. It's about 11% of GDP. So we're not going to achieve our growth objectives uh, unless we uh, unleash the financial sector uh, a key part of that is putting the Financial Services and Markets Bill into law by next Easter, this session of Parliament. Uh, the financial services sector has had no end of reviews. It's got more reviews than a Netflix uh, blockbuster. We've had the Kiot review, uh, the Khalifa review, the Hill review. You know, the intray is full, and now it's time to decide uh, and to deliver uh, and to get on and, and deploy some of these things. Uh, as part of that, we're going to use the opportunity of making our own rules uh, as a competitive advantage. Uh, but we're not seeking divergence for its own sake. We're, we'll diverge where it makes sense to do so uh, and where it gives us uh, a competitive opportunity. Uh, and then finally, we'll lose that to continue how we can play on a global stage with not just the international trade deals that you often hear about, but the architecture behind those, uh, mutual recognition, uh, making it more frictionless for financial products uh, to operate in other markets, as well as keep our own capital markets uh, incredibly open. And I think we're going to hear more in a moment about Solvency 2, uh, but Solvency 2, uh, which slightly amazingly went retail uh, during the, uh, the leadership campaign with both, both participants talking about that, is a huge opportunity. Uh, and I get that, and it's one of the, uh, the decisions that will be on the uh, Chancellor and the Prime Minister's desk over the coming weeks. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Admirably brief and clear, as I uh, have come to expect. Um, Mike, um, over to you. 
Thank you, David, and thank you to the Policy Exchange for inviting the Phoenix Group to participate in this conversation and um, discussion. So the Phoenix Group, we're the UK's largest long-term savings and retirement provider. We manage about £310 billion on behalf, of, on behalf of 13 million customers in the UK. So that means one in four adults in the UK have some form of pension provision with the Phoenix Group. And we take that very seriously because we are a purpose-driven organisation our purpose is to provide those 13 million customers, one in four adults in the UK, with a life of possibilities. And how we invest their £310 billion is a key determinant to that. But if we take a step back and look at the totality of the UK pensions and, and insurance sector, what is the size of the prize here? Well, the UK pensions and insurance sector has £3 trillion of assets under management to deploy. And whilst the UK insurance sector is one of the largest investors of any OECD company, with the exception of the United States, it is still our premise that we are not pulling our weight in terms of regional diversification and investment in the United Kingdom. And that if we are able to unlock that, that will give rise to long-term economic growth and prosperity. If we can unlock the ability for insurance and pensions money to invest in infrastructure, digital infrastructure, regional infrastructure and national infrastructure. If we can unlock that, those assets to invest in housing, where we've got a chronic housing shortage, we want to invest more in housing, social housing, housing for different parts of, of, of the communities. Education, another area where we, would, we stand ready to deploy more funds in long-term investment. And finally, in areas of venture capital and private, ca uh, private capital, these are key uh, assets that will be accelerants of economic growth in the UK. So what do we need to do to get this work? And I know it's something that Andrew and I have spoken about and others have spoken about. We need meaningful regulatory reform. Now, when we speak about regulatory reform, we absolutely have to have customer protection and financial stability at its core. We are not seeking to change that premise at all. But we have to make the regulations fit for purpose. And one of the asks that of the Phoenix Group is to make economic growth a primary regulatory objective. We have a duty to our policyholders and the customers to invest in a way um, which delivers that long-term investments over the, over the long term. And a key element of that is around the Solvency II reform and making that Solvency II reform meaningful and making it fit for purpose so that large institutions such as the Phoenix Group can invest in a meaningful way in a regionally diversified manner in, across the UK. Because as we look at our 13 million policyholders, they are not all concentrated in London and the South East, which is where, let's face it, historically, capital investment has been overweight. As we look at our 13 million policyholders and we plot them on the map of the United Kingdom, unsurprisingly, they are spread out across Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and right across England. And one of our key asks is to have regulation that permits us to invest in local communities so we can make it meaningful for our customers on the ground. We stand ready to work with government and others to, you know, to bring together private capital and public capital. Again, one of our asks of policymakers would be to take some of the great institutions that we've got, whether it's the British Business Bank, the UK Infrastructure Bank, or Homes England, and we deal with all of those institutions on, on an individual basis. Indeed, only last week, we invested alongside the British Business Bank in a venture debt fund. We think that we'd get much more bang for buck if there was a consolidation of efforts there. We'd have a much bigger voice at the table. Um, we welcome the announcement on lifts, and we stand ready to, uh, we stand ready to invest alongside that, again, subject to the prevailing regulatory, uh, regulatory conditions and regulatory change. Thank you, David. Great. Thanks a lot, Mike. Um, I turn to Rain. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks, David, and, and thanks very much to the Policy uh, Exchange for hosting us uh, this morning. Uh, look, at, at the CBI, we, we speak for over 190,000 businesses of all shapes and sizes uh, around uh, the UK, and I think what's clear is, is you know, businesses absolutely back the government's ambition to raise growth to 2.5%, I think. You know, like any good business, it's important to have uh, ambition and, and a clear target uh, for growth. And I think we're all uh, agreed uh, on that. And, and I think it's great to hear Andrew uh, talking about the role of, of financial services uh, in, in helping to deliver that growth and in uh, ensuring we have financial services that are 
um, globally competitive because we know financial services is, is essentially what drives that that growth a, around the UK. Um, but I thought I'd reflect a little bit just on, on the events of the past few days and, and, and then how we move forward uh, before thinking about, you know, what is the regulatory reform we really need to see to deliver and unlock some of that uh, growth in financial services to really drive investment uh, around the UK. Um, and I think from the businesses I, I spoke to, I think everyone recognises and, and we've seen that that you know, strong institutions and macroeconomic stability is the sort of bedrock of, of any plan uh, for growth. You know, to be able to invest, we need a predictable uh, outlook. Um, and I think it was certainly welcome. We've seen that the markets have certainly reacted positively to the Chancellor yesterday talking about you know, the need for a strong institutional framework, independence of the Bank of England, uh, the OBR. And I think, look, having the OBR publish their forecast and, and they're giving their assessment of, of the government's growth uh, plans earlier will, will help to, to build that confidence. And I think it's, um, you know, because I think businesses have really important emphasize to me that how low inflation, that stable outlook is important for their investment plans. And I think, you know, hopefully now we can move forward um, uh, and, and actually get, get going with the sort of growth plan and, and the things we need to deliver that. Uh, and I think we know in the UK, we've got a really long standing challenge about uh, investment, you know, investment as a proportion of GDP uh, in the UK, if we're talking about business investment is still one of the lowest uh, in the G7. Um, and, and I think we really need to have a, a focus on that uh, to really deliver the, the growth plan. Um, and that is absolutely looking at the overall tax landscape and corporation tax is definitely part of that. Uh, but I think we do need to broaden the uh, conversation and talk as well about business rates. When I talk to businesses around the UK, whether it's in the aviation sector or manufacturers or uh, retailers, so many talk about, you know, wanting to invest to make their properties more energy efficient to uh, back long term infrastructure projects. Um, uh, but at the moment, we do have one of the highest business property taxation uh, burdens in, in the G7. So I think that also does need to be part of the conversation, particularly if we're going to make the transition to a net zero economy where buildings and infrastructure is such a key part uh, of that. Um, and I think that brings me on to the sort of second point. I think what gov um, businesses are talking to me about is having that unequivocal uh, mandate and um, commitment to making that net zero transition from across the government. I think we've seen some really important indications on that recently uh, from the government, but I think we really need to, to follow through with that and also on the sort of policy frameworks we need to deliver. Uh, whether that's having a clear mandate for sustainable aviation fuels to, to help um, uh, deliver to decarbonize aviation, but also an area where the UK can really lead the world. If we can develop some of these technologies, and we definitely have the capability, uh, then we can help to, to lead the world in, um, uh, you know, and we also need to increase capacity in our electricity grid to decarbonize manufacturing, transport, and heat. And I think these are uh, some of the things that will really help to deliver and unlock the over 50 billion pounds of investment we need to uh, get to uh, per year to really help deliver that, that transition. But I think third and finally, we really need the sort of smart regulation uh, to help unlock some of the uh, finance for investment. And, and Andrew has already touched on, on some of that. It absolutely is about solvency to reform, thinking about capital ratios uh, and what's uh, needed to deliver both financial stability, but importantly, unlock some of the ability of investors to uh, invest in long-term infrastructure projects to deliver returns uh, for pensions. You know, make it easier for, for pension funds to invest uh, in real estate and some of these other long-term assets. And indeed, making it uh, a lot easier for firms to list uh, in the UK. The London Stock Exchange is an important uh, driver of growth in the UK. We need to make it easy for uh, businesses to list uh, here in the UK. Uh, and I think finally, it's about the measures to unlock uh, green finance. And of course, Andrew in his previous role played a huge role, I think, in helping to deliver uh, the government's plans and getting so many businesses signed up to the race to zero in the run up to COP26. And I think this year has uh, absolutely been about building on that. Uh, and I think all that has, has and will be done around the GFANS, you know, unlocking 
uh, the financial capital we need to get to net zero is really important. And the UK is leading the way in developing some of the transition plans. Uh, we need to deliver that. But I think we need proportionate regulation that uh, is developed in consultation uh, with business to really help to deliver that. And I think we can use uh, being a, a single country uh, and, and sort of learn from how some of these, the green tax, Naomi say, is being developed in the EU and elsewhere uh, and improve upon that here in, in the UK. So I think, look, in, in some, this is absolutely about getting the right tax landscape to in incentivize investment in the UK to make us globally competitive, having that macroeconomics uh, certainty, which is the bedrock uh, of any investment plans, and having the right uh, smart, proportionate regulation to really help to uh, deliver the, the change so that we can really unlock some of the finance that is available uh, to get uh, Britain investing on the right scale again. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, very thoughtful and thorough, um, all three uh, presentations. It's, it's left me with a, a couple of thoughts, maybe just to kind of kick the, the discussion off. Um, uh, I mean, UK investment, business investment levels have been lower than most G7 economies, uh, certainly lower than France and Germany, our, I guess we like to think of our, them as our comparators, have been lower than them sort of persistently over a prolonged period. And it's been acknowledged as a, uh, a weakness of the, the UK economy. So I guess, uh, I mean, I, I wonder what the panelists think about why that is so, because after all, we have all been operating under the same EU regulations, broadly similar uh, regulatory frameworks for quite a long time. What is it in the UK economy, UK sort of commercial sector that has persistently produced this outcome over a long period of time? Um, if it isn't just regulatory reform, but something deeper, then that suggests that you know, other kind of policy actions will be needed. My other question, perhaps, uh, you all touched on it maybe in different ways, is uh, the question of the, the regulators. Um, I hear a lot people say to me that um, the regulators uh, of various kind are too risk averse, too sort of um, still in the old world, if you like, uh, not enough focused on growth. Um, is is that fair? Is some institutional reform of the various regulators needed, do you think? So uh, who wants to kick off with, with any of this? Yeah, I'll, I'll have a go take that, David. Thank you. Look, I think there's a couple of really important points you raise there. Um, first is regulatory reform is absolutely key. And uh, us at the Phoenix Group, we're very, very clear the regulators have to have customer protection and financial stability at its core, but alongside economic pro prosperity. We're absolutely very key on that. And I think even the events over the past week, we should be very clear, the trillions of pounds that UK insurers have available to invest over the long term in the UK, this should not be tied up with LDI. That is completely separate. That is a very different and separate part of the financial markets. So the money that the 310 billion pounds that Phoenix have as the UK's largest long-term savings and retirement provider, none of that is LDI. We have got zero allocation to LDI. So it's a very different beast. We are, we are focused on investing that 310 billion pounds in the real economy over, over the very long term. And regulatory reform is key. I think, look, another element that's key as well, um, and this is not just in relation to the regulators, this permeates right through the financial services um, yeah, so financial services sector is the concept of risk appetite. Um, for, yeah, if you go to, if you pick up any of the sort of brochures from consultants or pension trustees, there's almost a race to the bottom in terms of risk averseness and cheapness of product. And we have to, we have to address that. We have to make it clear that actually if we want long-term economic growth and we want prosperity, they are not free lunches. They do not come with having a zero risk approach to investments. Now, as we take those risks, we need to take them in a very calculated, understood, and communicated manner. So we take, we take risks, but we take it in a very disciplined manner. So I think for, for us, there's, there's two elements. One is that regulatory reform, which we've spoken about. And two, much broader, is just the approach to risk appetite. And look, on risk appetite, 
one of the things that, that we would challenge ourselves and challenge some of the partners that we work on is that should we not be in a, in a manner which is soft compulsion requiring um, trustees of pension funds to explain to their members why they have decided not to invest in an infrastructure project that is local to their area. And again, this is, it's a departure from where we are right now, but we really do need to address this overall appetite to risk within the UK, UK financial services. Yeah. Um, look, I completely agree with everything Mike said on risk. I mean, you can't, you can't absolve risk from a financial system. Risk is the flip side of, of reward. Um, and, uh, and, and we definitely need to, to, to drive risk in. And there's a bigger cultural piece around that as well. Um, that voices like the CBI can be really valuable to is that you know you do need to take risk. The whole purpose that you know no one would ever start a business if they had no risk appetite. It's hard. You know there's there's lots of challenges to overcome along the way, um, but but we know the prizes are worth it. Um, I thought I'd pick up on on your first point about um, investment levels. Um, look. There's, there's some bits and pieces in there. I mean, there's a different mix of businesses that the UK has. Um, you know, we're less less heavy on tangible, um, you know, man, man, engineering, for example, that where it's easier to see where the investment goes. We're, we're, we're better on some of the services where it's, there's just a measurement issue, if you like, and a mix issue. Um, we've talked before on different platforms about labour um, and how, you know, the UK in the past has, has had too much... So cheap imported labour, and, and, and we need to reset that dial because that will tend to favour labour over capital when it comes to investment. Uh, and we've got a much more international economy uh, as well. So, um, you know, in many ways, UK capital is deployed uh, on a world stage, and that's not true of some of the more domestically focused markets. That's an enormous opportunity. That is where the growth is coming from in the world. Uh, but again, it does it does reflect in some of the domestic investment levels. Um, and then the, the, the final piece, David, mm -hmm. is, look, we've got to do the supply side reform. I mean, the UK is highly investable. You know, we have some issues with, you know, things like strikes. And we heard last week in Liverpool that, you know, the only supply side reform coming out of Labour was more rights for striking workers. Now, I put it to you that that's probably not the best way uh, to increase the top line growth in the uh, economy. Um, and, you know, again, we need, you know, everybody to call that out. It can't, if you just leave that, you know, to a small number of politicians, it doesn't work. We need the voice of people like the CBI as well to be calling out the headwinds that it places on the economy when people can't go to school, when they can't get to the places of work because of, you know, unionized sectors. So there's still a big job of work to do uh, to unleash that. But there's 40 pages in this document uh, many of which I think the last 138 paragraphs are a specific list of long-term investable projects. And we've got to tackle things like the planning system, just the slow, the slow clock speed of the modern British state. And if we can just accelerate that, suddenly things that aren't investable because of the uncertainty, because of the delay, because we're not as fast as other economies, then suddenly you open up many more opportunities. That's what the Prime Minister is very focused on. That's what the growth plan is all about. It's got a little bit um, underreported, um, but I would urge people to go back to this document and look at what's actually in here, um, and then we'll see a really exciting charter for, for what we're going to do over the next coming months and years. Thank you. Great. Um, uh, excellent. Well, I think just, just taking sort of both of the, those questions, I think this question about why is investment in, in the UK lower than some of our G7 uh, peers. And I think one of the things that's clear is uh, capital allowances is, is part of it. Historically, we've had one of the sort of lowest or least generous uh, capital allowances um, compared to some of our G7 peers. And there's, there's no doubt that that has had some of uh, an impact. And I think, look, when we had the super deduction uh, in place, that sort of brought us to the, the top of the league. And I think, you know, the annual investment allowance set at a million pounds will help, but it doesn't, you know, it, it still doesn't put us in that leading pack. So I think there's more we, we can do around that. And actually, interestingly, in the investment zones, right, the, the government have committed there to have both business rates reform, but also much more generous capital allowances. So, so really appreciating that, 
you know, they can help to drive uh, investment. So having that sort of permanent capital allowance for plant and machinery and also more generous capital allowances around buildings uh, and structures. And actually, as Steve Baker at our Fringe event uh, yesterday evening said, maybe we could have the, the whole of the UK have, have as an investment zone. I think he'd like that. Um, uh, you know, uh, so, so I think there is something we can do uh, around that. But I absolutely agree with others that there isn't, you know, there's no perfect secret sauce on this, right? I mean, if it was, if any of this was easy, it would have already uh, been done. But I think that also brings me on to the second point about some of the things that were in uh, the growth plan that I think we can really make more of. Because, you know, when you talk to a lot of businesses, they say the challenge in the UK with some of our big infrastructure projects is that we just take so much longer to deliver those projects because to get the consent, the planning reform to really drive it. So I think having that list of projects is really important and being prepared to tackle some of the planning reform to deliver some of that, uh, you know, done well. Uh, and I think it does have to be done well and bringing communities alongside will be important and I think even just you know some of the developments around onshore wind and and making it um, quicker for those to be approved in in the UK would uh, help us uh, get with some of those leading uh, countries who are developing some of these new technologies um, and I think finally around the you know the sort of sense of, of risk aversion amongst regulators I think that's definitely a factor one of the things that businesses talk a lot to me about is that a lot of the regulators are very focused uh, because of this, the way the system is set up around price and price outcomes for consumers and don't always think about the quality of outcomes for consumers and particularly over the long term. And so it makes it harder for businesses in regulated sectors to try and do some of the long term investments, which will improve the quality of outcomes uh, for consumers. So I think we do need to look at how we do regulation uh, in this country to make sure that innovation is part of that, that competitiveness of the UK is part of some of the things that they are also considering and that we're prepared to do some of the things that are hard and, and the electricity market, right, is, is one of those. We've got to move away from a system where the marginal, you know, the marginal price of electricity generation in the UK is effectively zero at times because of, you know, the price of renewables, uh, and yet it's it's linked at the moment to to the price of wholesale wholesale gas. So, you know, the government is committed to looking at that. We've got to use these next two years to really sort out some of that more difficult uh, reform in in the electricity market. Great, thank you. Um, I mean, two two reflections on this, and then I'll. I'll, I'll um, Ask the panel again, and then we'll 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 open the the floor. First is that if we've been having this discussion maybe five ten years ago, I guess everyone would have talked about sort of city short termism as a problem and the need to you know deliver short run returns instead of having a long run perspective. And nobody's mentioned that, so I, I wonder is you know is that not seen as a problem if it ever was? Uh, I think it was always a bit overstated. Um, so that's one issue, and, and sort of connected to it is um, industrial policy. You know, our, our approach on this has swung back and forth over the last decade or so, uh, probably. Um, some of the things you're describing in terms of sort of soft compulsion to invest in infrastructure and, and projects are kind of on that spectrum, I suppose, even if they're not full-dress industrial policy. Is that where the government kind of wants to go is it where it should go is it you know do we still need that semi-direction to get some of the things to to happen um and andrew do you want to have a go at that first yeah um look on on short term termism i think it was always a little overblown i mean my the business i worked in for 20 years um it's, Sky. It was the journey from you know analog to digital. So a very disruptive business. Um, you know, lost money for multiple years. Um, you know, took a business from profit back into an investment curve. Um, and although the markets are always bumpy, if you explain, you know, if that's well communicated, um, and you can build an aligned group of shareholders, um, then I think I think that's doable. Obviously, we need more of those businesses because. The nature of technological change and scale is often that, that there are more of those. The Hill Review on listings has lots of really good recommendations on that. Um, and I think there's, there's now a good consensus uh, for things like reforming some of the corporate governance, for some of the uh, dual class shares and things. 
that pendulum probably went a little bit too far in, in, a, in a purist direction, um, and we can unlock that. Um, and then there are some important reforms in the financial services space, um, such as so many of our financial products, you know, at the moment mandate things like daily pricing. Now, as soon as you, you mandate a daily price, it's very it's not that technical, is it, really, for this illustrious group? But as soon as you mandate that, it's very hard to invest in what they call illiquid assets, you know, property, um, you know, clean energy. I mean, those things aren't by their nature. They would tend to have long-term build phases. Uh, and although you know that there'll be a good long-term return, that won't necessarily manifest itself on a short-term time horizon. Those are exactly without providing investment advice, those are exactly the sort of things you want to do to match long-term liabilities. Um, but, but there's been some imped impediments around that, and that's obviously on the work stack that the Chancellor set me to work through as to how we can bring forward sensible reforms. You know, and a lot of these reforms are not, you know, they're not pro-business or anti-business or prosumer. You know, they're just sensible, often quite technical reforms to either release capital or make markets work more efficiently. Uh, and I think we can, we can do, do lots of those. Yeah, I think just to, just to add a couple of points uh, to what Andrew said there. I mean, again, as, a, as the chief investment officer for the UK's largest long-term savings and retirement provider, we, by definition, do not think over the short term. When we set our asset allocation, which we continuously review, we have a time horizon not of multiple years, but of multiple decades. Why is that? Because when a person comes in, joins the workforce, and starts paying their pension contribution, they're typically in their 20s. And um, who knows when they will retire, but at the very least, it's going to be in their 60s. So that affords us the opportunity to invest those individuals or those cohorts' uh, pension contributions with a time horizon that spans multiple decades. And even when they get into retirement, if people, someone retires at the age of 65, Given the advances in medical science, it's likely that they're going to be around for the best part of 25, 30 years. Again, even in retirement, that affords us to invest over multiple decades. And I think that's one of the, that's one of the prizes that we're not focused on right now, is, is thinking about investing over the very long term. And in terms of our approach to that investment and delivering our 13 million customers with a life of possibilities, we really think about outcome-orientated investments. And so, again, I would put it to this illustrious audience right now, if we think about the, car the path to carbon net zero, we aren't, we're not foolish. We do not believe that overnight someone is suddenly going to invent you know, clean hydrogen or carbon capture that can be scaled on, on you know, available for the masses or exported. These technologies will only be developed over time, but over time with investment now. So the investments that we make right now we need to be thinking about the payoff for these investments, both in terms of the economic payoff that feeds through to the underlying customer, but also the, the payoff for the broader society and, and indeed our path to, path to carbon net zero over multiple, multiple decades. And that's something that right now, the current configuration in the UK long-term savings and retirement space, the regulations and again, the risk appetite don't really permit or, pro or, or propel one to do so. And that's why I think we've got a real opportunity now to change that framework to allow us to make those long-term investments that will pay out for our customers, shareholders, and society at large over the long term. Um, yeah, I mean, I think look on, on short-termism uh, being uh, the reason for it, I think it's you know it's it's sort of too easy uh, an answer, and I think if you compare compare us with the U.S., where arguably you know also not you know not always taking that sort of long term uh, approach, I think you know they're, they're still doing more on on investment. So I think it's just it's just more complicated um, uh, than that. It may be a factor, but I don't think it explains all of the the reason. I I think I, I guess sort of building on on Mike's point though, where I think government can really play. Uh, a role is just, you know, providing some of the long-term frameworks. And I think we've done really well in the UK, right? We, we were one of the first advanced economy to have a net zero target embedded uh, in, uh, in policy. And I think we've also now with the energy strategy, right, set out those sort of high level targets and what we need to do in terms of electricity generation, how much will come from, you know, needs to come from onshore wind, offshore wind, nuclear, et cetera. I think having setting those tram lines are, are really important to providing 
long-term certainty. But I think what we need to see now is, is just you know, more of the detail underneath each of those targets so that then uh, businesses can get behind some of these long-term investments. And I think it's just the credibility of sticking with that long-term framework, I think, is what makes it easier for, for businesses to make some of these investments because you know, infrastructure lasts uh, for decades. So... Um, yeah, I think we need both that long-termism from business, but, but also from, from policymakers working together to deliver it. Great. Thank you. Um, so uh, let's uh, open the floor for questions. Um, we might take two or three together, perhaps. Um, where shall we start? I think over there was just first. I think there's a mic, so... Um, sorry, right, right over there, the lady in the orange... Thank you. Um, Councillor Deborah Taylor, I'm the Deputy Leader at Leicestershire County Council. I'm just really interested about what the panel's view is on where local authorities fit within this, because I think for far too long there's been a too big a gap between business and, and local authorities, and I think we're all at that reset point, aren't we, where we've um, restarted the computer and we've got a real opportunity here to move forward. So I'd just be interested in your view about how businesses can support local authorities that we all know are struggling with funding, but, you know, infrastructure, housing, all that sort of stuff is really key for local authorities. Very interesting question. Let's take one other, uh, maybe here, yeah, and then... Uh, Bobby Vidral from um, uh, Mark Regal. Um, being involved with the deployment of German capital in foreign direct investments, the one thing that is noticeable with Britain is, is a bit related to what the lady just said, it's very difficult to find out who's in charge. You know, if you want to invest in, let's say, Yeovil, like, who is it? Is it the mayor, the LEP, the MP, the devolved authority? The, like, it's incredible. And uh, it's, if you think about it, if, if you invest in Oregon, you just call the governor. If you invest in G Bavaria, you just call the first minister of Bavaria. You don't call Berlin. And here, it's, it's literally, you need a PhD. So I was, I was wondering, why do they not, I mean, the, the lieutenant governors exist in every county. Just put that telephone book out, or I mean, people don't even know they exist. But all I'm saying is, you don't need to create something new, but uh, just to create a regional person of reference who then can then put that investment call maybe through. Um, well, we've got two questions on uh, the same sort of area, and I must say, when you co uh, my personal view, when you when you compare the UK to somewhere like France, which has a very sort of Cartesian structure of local government that everybody can understand, and ours, which is, you know, bafflingly incomprehensible to uh, non-experts, and actually to a lot of experts as well, I think. Um, I, I'd, I'd be interested in reflections. Is this actually part of the, the, the problem? Um, maybe, Andrew, you probably should start on this. Yeah, I think... Um let me try and be sort of be respectful of uh, of colleagues. It's slightly off um, off base. I mean, I think I think that's exactly right. I mean, you know, one of the things about supply side is this point about how long it takes to do things. And if you just look at the number of different generally statutory bodies that are entitled to opine on something, you know, even really something quite small, you know, you're often asking the CAA, you know, to just check there's no, uh, no air clearances issues. Now, we can see the logic of that individually, but collectively, uh, there's an awful lot of different people with decision rights. Um, I think, like, I'd, I'd point to two things. So, so success, in my book, success begets success. So we, sh we can all draw on the experience of COVID, when people, everybody, rolled up their sleeves, worked together, clear task and had a very decisive manner so everyone knew their allotted role it wasn't that it wasn't complex but everyone was pulling together and, and more of that for sure um, secondly our colleague from uh, Germany makes you know a very good point and I suspect is pushing a little bit on on where you are I'll speak as a local member of parliament rather than as as, as, as a minister I would love to see Counties. I mean, I'm a fan of counties. Everyone will have their own different local government fetish about which layer to focus on. But, but counties, you know, have some really weighty responsibilities. You know, a lot of them are around the sort of infrastructure space. Um, and different governments of different flavours, I don't draw judgments. You know, one minute it's regional, you know, there's government offices of the regions. 
You know, then it was the local uh, economic partnerships. I mean, lots of different points in the cycle. I would, I would look to see more single level bodies empowered. Um, so, uh, so I, I think, I think there's something in that. And I say the investment zones would hopefully be a great proof of concept. And once you've proven something like that out, then you can deploy that more widespread. Some of the county deals, um, you know, you can ask for the economic rights in your area. I mean, I'd, West Sussex, I'd like to see them do more of the business promotion because often that's a very good layer that you can join things up. Uh, I, I guess just, just two points. I think um, to the lady, uh, councillor's question, I think you know, local authorities are absolutely critical in, in all of this, particularly when you think about the net zero transition. And that sounds very high level, but actually that how that happens is, is exactly what happens at the local authority level. It's about how, how we heat our homes, the local tran, uh, transportation, how, how the electricity grid can support all of that. Um, and I think look, where can businesses play a role? It's hopefully partnering uh, with local authorities to help to deliver some of that, you know, even in terms of the, the skills we need to deliver that. I think that we haven't really talked about how skills interact, but it's so critical, both in terms of developing skills uh, within the working population, but also within uh, local authorities who are almost at the, in the sort of crosshairs of, of the delivery. So uh, I think it's really important. And, and we actually recently did a report with Data City looking at almost at the local authority level, where, what are the sort of net zero businesses uh, available, where are emissions in, in the local area and, and where are the real opportunities. And I think hopefully that, that provides uh, some help. Um, finally, I think on the, you know, the question about local leadership, I, I suppose as a, as a British Canadian, I feel that devolution here in the UK is still very much in its infancy. Um, and I think what, you, what we can see actually is you're absolutely right, where we have strong local leaders that people recognize they can really help to deliver results. And I think the way that Andy Street advocates for uh, the West Midlands, and I think Andy Burnham in, in Manchester and what Ben Houchin is doing in the Northeast is really innovative. They're all showing a real leadership. And I think if we can roll out that sort of system more broadly around the UK, uh, you know, it really helps to provide a counterpoint where people know who, who they need to talk to to get things done and have a better, um, you know, ability to make decisions across transport, across some of the local skills and, and bringing that picture uh, together and really advocate for their region as well. Mm, interesting. Mike, do you want to add? Yeah, maybe if I just add, I think, that, first of all, I think there are two great questions and I would take each of them in turn. So, Councillor Deborah Taylor, I think um, your question is, is literally on the money. And as the UK's largest long-term savings and retirement provider, we invest substantial sums in local authorities and with councils. And we direct that. We work very closely with the local authorities to direct those funds. So over the last year, we have invested over £1.2 billion in local authorities, lent money to local authorities so they can use it as they see fit. We've also worked with them to build out infrastructure and importantly housing, so affordable and social housing. We absolutely want to do more with local authorities and councils. Why? Because our 13 million customers, I don't know how many of them live in Leicestershire, but I imagine it's a decent number. They live there, we want, and they want us to do that as well. And so we're very keen to have direct communication and investment uh, lines of communication with um, councillors such as yourselves and with your colleagues. So we'd love to sort of take you up on that and, and, do, and do more there. I think, Bobby, turning to your question in terms of, yeah, how do you find the person who's in charge, who is empowered, but also who is accountable? And I think both go hand in hand. You can't empower someone unless you make them accountable. And I do think the UK does need that, both empowerment and accountability. And I come at this, and we come at this at the Phoenix Group, very sort of half glass full, opportunistically. There's a massive opportunity to really lay the foundations for long-term economic growth in the UK on a regionally diversified manner. But we shouldn't get away from the fact, and it comes to a point that, that Andrew made earlier, particularly as it pertains to planning laws, the pace at which we do things, the cadence at which we do things. If things don't progress at the right pace, the UK has to realize that it is competing on an international stage for our pounds investments. And if we can't get the right traction in a with a local authority or with a mayoral authority, or we get bogged down, projects that we invest in get bogged down in planning, 
then crudely, we will just go elsewhere and invest our money because we have to be invested. And when I say go elsewhere, we would, there's an international market that is, would, would, you know, is calling out for our investments, calling out for the billions of pounds. But that would be a real shame if we didn't take the opportunity to make sure we have the right empowerment and accountability to get things done at pace. Because if we don't get things done in pace, I am an asset manager, investment professionals, they get bored pretty easily. And so just being, you know, going through the treacle of something like you know, planning permission, is people are just going to get bored and invest elsewhere. And that won't be in the UK. And that's a massive opportunity cost for this country. Yeah, that's a troubling thought. Um, let me, um, let's open the floor a bit further. More questions. Uh, yeah, maybe the gentleman in pink tie, and then we'll take a couple of others. Uh, thanks very much, Councillor Phil Dogert, City of Edinburgh. Uh, so thanks for your investment in the city, Mike, and no pressure. I hope it continues for a very long time. Um, uh, but uh, I would point out as well, as, a, as an actuary, there are other long-term savings uh, companies available in the UK. Uh, <laughs> however, two questions around regulation, which, which you helpfully mentioned, David. First of all, Solvency 2, and probably direct these at, at Andrew. Um, there's a big difference between the requirements for long-term investors like Phoenix and uh, the sh more short-term investors like the general insurers. Can we make sure that we have a regulatory regime post-reform that actually reflects the need of that, that allows the long-term investors to do what they do best and the general insurance companies to do uh, what they do best. But at the same time, let's not throw the baby out with the bath, bath water. The 2004 system that we had in the UK was pretty good until it was corrupted by the need to compromise on Solvency 2. Um, and secondly, on pensions, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad last week was mentioned around LDI, let's recognise that the cause of that was the direction from the pensions regulator. And I think the silence from the pensions regulator over the last week has not been particularly helpful. And a bit of a mea culpa might be useful. Um, because the, the problem we've got here is lots of businesses that RAIN represents um, are left with legacy overheads that they don't understand, don't know how to run. But they're a drag on investment. They're a drag on growth. So can we get the reform that allows those schemes to be consolidated as quickly as possible. And let's make sure that, that Chloe Smith at DWP doesn't drag our heels in this. Uh, and we can free up the long-term investment that's available from schemes that still have 50, 70 years to go, rather than worry, worrying about just investing in gilts. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm uh, having run a couple of small businesses, I guess, and trade associations very aware of that that second problem, I must say. Can we take a couple of, of others? Yeah, uh, Connor here. Um, Hi, thanks. Uh, Connor McDonald, Policy Exchange. Um, head of economics here. Uh, one of the questions I have is, what can government institutions that invest for, in particular, the local government pension scheme, 340 billion, broadly equivalent in scale to some of the international pension schemes, but still manages to invest far less in infrastructure, venture capital, private equity. Um, what can government do to lead the way on, in these important areas and make sure that government institutions are actually setting a standard for, to, uh, to generate cultural change in the wider industry? Mm, interesting. interesting question. One more, I think, if, if you want. Yes, here in the front right. Uh, Prakash Chandra Mohan from Tizer. Uh, a question regarding how to make the regulator more entrepreneurial, more risk-taking. Um, you know, look, we, we completely agree with the competitiveness objective that's, that's being placed on the regulators. But you know, finding that consumer protection solution, it, it lies on a continuum. And you, you, you weaken it slightly, and the risk of a, a scandal goes from 1% to 3%. Um, I've made those figures up, but the, the point is that, you know, if they then get bashed as a result of a scandal coming in, um, you know, how do, we, how do we just get that sort of balance and how do we make them more, more entrepreneurial? Yeah, good, good question. Um, I'll turn to the panel. Don't feel you've got to answer every question, but, but um, reflections, comments on the questions we've had. Rain, do you want to go first? Uh, I, well, I think just sort of starting a, a bit of it, just, just to kind of... I think we've got an opportunity now to, to really get things done. We've got, you know, government is understandably you know, has an urgency to, to get to our sort of growth target. So I think we've got to use that to get the reforms done that we think will help to uh, achieve that. Um, 
I, I mean, I think, look, I, I guess to uh, Connor's question, I, I wonder, I, I feel like you probably have some good answers uh, for us on that. So uh, probably listen to some, uh, you know, some of the thoughts that are out there in terms of what, what you and other think tanks are really sort of putting out there in terms of how we really uh, can unlock some of that because you can see, you know, I absolutely recognize that. I'm always struck by, you know, th the fact that the Canadian pension plan is always over uh, in the UK thinking about how they can uh, invest in these long-term assets and seem to have more of an ability uh, to do that. So what, what can we learn about how that system uh, works to, to make it work better uh, for, for us? And I think, Prakash, your question is, is a really good one, right? And I think it, it takes sort of two things. One, it, you know, is it acknowledging that it's really hard, that regulators are under pressure. And I think we do have to be, I don't know how we achieve this, but, but a bit more forgiving that when, when things do go wrong, that, that doesn't mean that the entire system around regulation was flawed, right? You, we have to increase our risk tolerance as well as our risk appetite. Um, and I think look, the more that we have, you know, we make it easier for people to move in and out of the regulators so they get fresh ideas um, and, uh, you know, from the private sector, et cetera, into, into working within uh, regulators and, 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 and that sort of cross-fertilization, I think, could, could really help. But I, I, I think saying this is easy, you know, it, it, it's hard to do, right, because they feel a duty uh, of care and responsibility, and yet at the same time we need that innovation and we need, a, a, you know, a higher risk appetite as well. Yeah, I think I'll just add a, add a couple of points. Well, firstly, to Phil, we're, we're, a, we're a big fan of Edinburgh. We employ thousands of people up there. We, will, uh, we are and continue and will be a long-term investor in Edinburgh. It's a fantastic city, and I love spending time up there. And like you, I'm an actuary by background and think about investing very over the very, very long term. And you're absolutely right to pull me up on the fact that Phoenix are not the only UK's largest uh, long-term savings and retirement provider. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely spot on. And we really see you know, industry collaborating. We, we have no problem investing alongside um, our peers like Legal and General and Aviva. And in fact, I caught up with Mark Versi yesterday, who's the CEO of Aviva Investors, and we've already done that. And we think we want to do more of that subject to that right regulatory regime. I think, Connor, in terms of your question, you know, bringing those local authority pension schemes together, yeah, some significant progress has been made. This is not my area, but it, it's, it's very clear that if you bring them even closer together, the synergies that they will create and just the footprint that they will have in terms of their investment firepower is significant. And I think Rain's absolutely right to point out the model of the Canadian pension schemes and pension plans, who, again, we've invested alongside. These are highly sophisticated investment houses that manage that long-term money for, for Canadian pension, uh, pensioners. Um, and I think it's that, looking at that model is completely appropriate. Look, as for the regulatory regime, again, we fundamentally believe that you know, customers, consumer protection, financial stability, alongside economic growth, should be the absolute core of the regulatory regime. And in terms of our dialogue with government, with regulators, as it relates to proposed Solvency II reform, we should be absolutely clear. We are not looking for reductions in the amount of capital that we have to hold. If we, if we invest in more risky assets, we are perfectly comfortable with holding more regulatory capital. But just the, the nature of the Solvency II regime and how it restricts long-term investors, such as ourselves and Phil, what it restricts us into means that there's a massive opportunity cost because we're not able to invest in a myriad of different assets that will help the UK's long-term economic growth. But it also, and this point is often overlooked, it concentrates us into certain asset classes. So when a financial crisis occurs, occurs and it's not, it's not a matter of if, it's when, we find ourselves pretty much invested alongside uh, the assets that our peers are invested. And that cannot be good for that financial stability that, 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 will, that will be needed when the next economic crisis occurs. Um, so agree, agree with those. Um, let me pick up a few things. I mean, the government's policy is pro-consolidation um, of that. I'd love to hear the voice more of local government pension scheme. I mean, they've, they've, they've weighed in on things like climate and, you know, there's lots of governance things. Let's hear them about economic growth. Let's hear about the opportunity. That, that's a really powerful voice. Um, and the points about how you make the regulator more competitive. I mean, 
we've, we've collectively piled duty upon duty on the regulators and, and then there's a, you know, inevitably a media culture of risk aversion, nothing must ever be seen to fail, or even though we all understand that some failure is a, is a tolerable uh, necessity of, of how you grow an economy. Um, the one thing everybody can do to help, um, and, and the voice of CBI is really important in this, is talk about the fabulous core purpose of business. Um, you know, we have as a society, we've got to go back to making love to free enterprise, the productive power of business, of risk taking. And it's, it's just an underdeveloped mean. We're, you know, there's whole parts of the broadcasting estate that are dedicated to consumer protection and, and, and all of that. Fine, that's great. But where do you hear the fabulous stories about entrepreneurs, of risk takers, of problem solving, risk capital? Um, and I, and I think the sector, I'm, I'm going to really put my arms around the sector, but also encourage them to be out there making their voice, you know, their core purpose, whether it's feeding us, discovering new drugs that are going to extend human life, uh, you know, the, the financial sector. I mean, in, insurance is a magical product, the ability to transmit risks between different groups in society, uh, investment to uh, transmit wealth across generations, all of the big problems in society need a really high functioning financial sector to operate. And I fear, you know, there was a bit post 2008 where everyone just put their heads down. They said, oh, we're getting a lot of inbound from the, uh, the media. We'll just hunker down and hope it goes away rather than being out there making the positive case. If you don't make the positive case upstream, the downstream regulation you get is, you know, just people can never, never fail. People, people don't want to make that case. And, and it's great that, you know, we've got groups like Phoenix out there and, and others who are talking about all the positives in society that the financial sector will deliver. But we can't do enough of that because if you don't, if you don't get that core purpose established in people's minds, if you don't help me make that connection to someone living in a mid-terrace in Middlesbrough, you know, why do they need a productive financial services sector I mean, absolutely they do, because we won't grow the economy. We won't be able to afford our NHS. But we've got to create that link in people's minds. And that needs lots of voices talking about all the good that they do. Great. Thank you, Andrew. I think on that note, which sounded like a sort of concluding note, I'm going to, to conclude, because everybody's timetable is very pressed. And I do want to, to finish uh, on time. Um, uh, big thank you to to the panelists for for joining us. I think what we've heard is is that you know there isn't a silver bullet. There's lots and lots of uh, different things that need to be done to fix this problem. Speed, uh, the planning system, local leadership, maybe uh, uh, the right degree of regulatory reform, maybe some different behaviour from the regulators. Um, long-term framework from the government, tax framework being set set right, all those things. And I guess one thing we therefore also need on top of this is a stable government with a broad consensus uh, on its objectives and the ability to deliver them. And hopefully that's what we're going to uh, find out we've got uh, in the next uh, days and weeks. On that note, thank you once again to, to the panelists. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks.